Tonight's episode of Legacy Battle is brought to you by Atlas Benefits. Atlas Benefits has solutions for your insurance needs. Atlas Benefits can help you obtain Medicare, health, or life insurance, and employee benefits. You can find them on the web at www.atlasbenefits.com. Or you can contact Rob Ducey or Roy Smith at 727-600-2892 and mention Legacy Battle Podcast. Atlas Benefits has all the solutions for your insurance needs. Enjoy the show. This is Legacy Battle coming at you on YouTube, Facebook, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. You can sponsor this show. Contact us in the comments section. Michael Adams here, creator of Legacy Battle. Joining me tonight from the Gridiron Battle Zone, Brian King, Penn State Collegiate All-Star, Kevin Adams, Ball State athlete, Paul Habakot. And we're joined tonight by the head coach of Oklahoma Christian University, the swim team, both men and women, if I read correctly. In college at Texas, he earned 23 All-American honors and an NCAA championship. He swam at the 96 Olympics in Atlanta, becoming the only man at that Olympics to win three gold medals. In 2000, he served as a U.S. team captain, picking up two silver medals. And he is a nine-time U.S. national champion as well in the 200-meter freestyle. Five-time Olympic medalist swimmer, Josh Davis. Josh, thank you for joining us. Great to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. Always an honor for us to have Olympic athletes on this show that represented the country. That 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 is true. That's what that's what sports is about. So thank you so much. Um, so we're going to talk to Josh as always after the debate Q and A about his career and and probably some of his questions about his coaching as well. Tonight's debate is the top five Olympic swimmers of all time, and we're going to start out with Mark Spitz. Okay, Mark Spitz. I, when I was researching Mark, I kind of viewed him as maybe an early on version of Michael Phelps. I wonder um, how he feels about Mark, uh, Michael Phelps's career. But uh, born February 10th, 1950 in Modesto, California. He actually moved out of there, and this is kind of where his swimming legacy started. They moved, a family moved him over to Honolulu, and they said that basically every day he would run full speed to, you know, to Waikiki Beach, the water's there. And it, it almost looked like he was going to kill himself. He would just run right into the water and swim all around. And by the age of 10, he was starting to carve out, the, you know, this legendary swim status. He held 17 uh, national age group and one world record already. He was named uh, the world's best 10 and under swimmer. So going on to 16, he ends up winning the 100-meter butterfly at the National AAU Championships, the first of his two, uh, first of his 24 AAU titles. And then the next year, in 1967, he won five gold medals at the Pan American Games in Winnipeg. In the uh, 1968 Olympics, he won two golds. Uh, controversy there was that he guaranteed six, came away with two, but... Uh, I think he's pretty confident in his, in his talents. He was a nine-time Olympic champion, won the gold medal seven times. His most successful Olympics was at the 72 Games, the ones famous for the um, tragic uh, terrorism event. But uh, he goes in the 72 uh, Games, he's a, he wins seven times in world record time, all while sporting the iconic mustache. I think that's what kind of he's known for is he had – this mustache during these 72 games. And um, he starts getting sort of some endorsements from this, but it doesn't, it doesn't last long, but in a short period of like two years, he gets about $7 million in endorsements, which is a lot of money back then, obviously. Uh, he's a member of many Hall of Fames, uh, to name a few, International Swimming Hall of Fame, inducted 1977. United States uh, Olympic Hall of Fame, inducted 1983, 
Southern California Jewish Hall of Fame, 1990 San Jose Hall of Fame, uh, Long Beach City College Hall of Fame, Indiana University Athletics Hall of Fame. Uh, so I think that Mark Spitz, although maybe just a little bit short of what he would guarantee, he definitely uh, kind of paved the way for swimmers in the in the future. So, Josh, our, our show does all sports. Uh, so, you know, a lot of our viewers might not be familiar with swimming. So I'm going to coordinate my questions, not only about the athlete we're talking about, but maybe a little background, too, on the stroke. So Spitz, you know, was pretty good at the butterfly, which, you know, has a reputation for being hard to learn and quickly exhausting. So is that the hardest stroke? And what are your thoughts on Mark Spitz? Yeah, butterfly is this, in my opinion, the second most difficult stroke because the arms have to come over the water at the same time. To me, breaststroke, the frog stroke, the timing and the ankle flexibility to the breaststroke properly, to me, is the most difficult and takes the longest. But once a normal person or normal swimmer gets used to butterfly, they figure out the tricks pretty easily and can progress at it. But obviously, Mark Spitz was way ahead of his time breaking all those world records in the fly and freestyle and a part of the relays was something the world had never seen. So he was the original GOAT, the greatest of all, all time, seven world records in seven days, seven golds. Um, that was the standard for 36 years. And, you know, I was born September 1st, 1972. On the day he was winning one of the seven gold medals. So kind of crazy that I was born that week, he was winning. My mom and dad were watching those Munich Olympics on their little black and white TV. And my mom's is like, come on, take me to the hospital. It's coming. And my dad's like, hold on, let me watch one more race. So kind of weird that we were, you know, I came out that week. But uh, yeah, Mark, Mark Spitz was the, the icon of, of a generation and, um, you know, really put the Olympics on the map as far as, you know, the USA watching it. And, and I think the 1980 Miracle on Ice team did that as well. But um but that, that 72 moment was, was pretty spectacular and cemented him in history. But yeah, his domination in the butterfly was, was huge. In fact, he was, he, he, he's kind of a cocky guy. He gets labeled as kind of a cocky guy, but he was very confident. In fact, he was so confident he made a comeback because no one was really going that much faster than his times in 72. So in 92, 20 years later, he made a comeback at 41. It didn't work out so well. He made good money and it made for good TV. But the, the truth was, he was so good that not many people had gone faster than his time in 72, all the way back, all the way forward in 92. So kind of interesting. Took U.S. swimming to the next level. But because of that, we're going to talk to the, we're going to talk about the guy who came right before Mr. Spitz. We're going to talk about John Neighbor. All right, John Neighbor. Uh, John Neighbor, another American, uh, born in Illinois. Uh, then he attended USC. And just had a dominating run there. They won four consecutive national championships. So every every year he was there, they won the national national title. Um, you know, his his Olympic story started in 1976 in Montreal. He won the 100 meter backstroke, 200 uh, meter backstroke golds for both of those, 200 meter freestyle relay, 100 uh, meter medley relay golds for both of those. And then the 200 meter freestyle, he got silver. Um, so not only did he win gold in all four of those events, but each was in world record time. So he was shattering records at the same time as, as being better, better than everybody else in the pool at that point. Um, he was the first person to ever compete the 200 meter backstroke in under two minutes. No one had ever done it before in under two minutes. And he was the first person to ever uh, complete the 100 meter backstroke in under 56 seconds. So just blazing speed out of him. Um, neighbor was given the, the James E. Sullivan Award, which goes to the best amateur a American athlete, regardless of sport, uh, in 1977. So the following year, they thought he was the best amateur athlete in the entire country. Um, he went on to become the, uh, the spokesman for Speedo uh, Swimwear. Um, and then he was a commentator um, for nine, Olymp nine separate Olympic games. Um, there is, I, we had him as a guest one time on his show, and I don't know if there's a person on the planet that knows more about the Olympics than this guy. I mean, this guy is just <laughs> an, an encyclopedia with the Olympics. And he was, a, he was a hell of a swimmer, too. 
Yeah, I was, I was going to bring that up. If, if, if you're a John Neighbor fan, check, check out his episode in our archives, everybody. Josh, what, what I want to ask you about John, he, uh, I, I got the impression that he feels he was the last true amateur of the sport. Like after that, it was mostly professionals from that point on. I know. What are your thoughts about that? And and was he maybe like not not the first American swimmer, but like well, maybe the first American swimmer to to really put it on the map in USA. Yeah, he was. You know, a couple of years after Spitz '76, um, he was the most dominant swimmer of the '76 Montreal Games, and he was the real leader of that men's, that U.S. men's team. And that U.S. men's team is the most dominant uh, swim team in history. They, you know, because back then we could take three guys per event and we would go gold, silver, bronze, gold, silver, bronze in all these different events. And so that men's team led by John Neighbor was so dominant. And of course the USA team, not many people may know this, is the most dominant swim, most dominant sports team in history. If you look at the USA team from 1908 to 2021, no team, basketball, football, gymnastics, nothing comes close to the dominance and medals and records that the USA men's and women's swim team has in world history. And that 76 team was the, the most dominant of all of them. And he was the leader. And I'm a big John Neighbor fan because he's such a nice guy. Like you said, he's an encyclopedia of Olympic uh, trivia and Olympic stories. And he's a great storyteller. He's a great commentator. He's a great friend to all of us Olympians. He's been leading the Olympic movement for many, 20 years now. And he's a heck of a guy. But, um, but yeah, what he did at college, what he did at Olympics was, was, was unbelievable. His world records lasted for over seven years. No one touched his records for seven years in the backstroke. So, yeah, heck of a swimmer. So what, what, what do you think, why do you think America is so dominant in swimming? I mean, is it, it can't just be more pool time. I mean, that's got to be something more to it than that. Well, we do have this, I mean, USA is so blessed in so many ways, but we have this great feeder program where we had all these neighborhoods that had neighborhood pools. And of course, summer league was a great thing to do in the summers and, uh, you know, great, great, uh, towns where a lot of these people for, you know, Mark Spitz in, in um, California and uh, John Neighbor in Chicago. Anyway, all these old towns had great summer league pools and then they had great high school teams and then they went on to their college team and nothing rivals our college system to feed into the USA team. So we had this great feeder pyramid of great, you know, neighborhood teams, great high school teams, great college teams, and boom, we produce the best national team. So, since the 40s and 50s, we've had this incredible feeder program that no other country can really duplicate. That's why all those foreigners, they come here and swim college here because that's how they, half of them, that's how they represent their national team. Well, let's, let's move on to our first foreigner of the night. That's going to be Ian Thorpe. And I'm representing Ian tonight, which I'm actually a huge fan of his, uh, especially for the time period that I grew up. So he fits right into those, to those years. But, uh, He's nicknamed Thorpedo. Uh, I, I love that. That's a great nickname. You know, you, it's not just part of his name, but you got the whole like Speedo thing in there too. So that's kind of cool. But uh, he's the most uh, most successful Australian athlete, uh, in in my opinion, and by far its greatest swimmer, in my opinion, as well. So between 98, 1998 and 2004, he won five Olympic gold medals, 11 world championships, and this is a guy who he started swimming competitively at eight years old and started breaking records at 13 years old. So in the pool, very young, very young breaking records. At 14, he became the youngest national team member for Australia. And at 15, he becomes the youngest world swimming champion, setting a world record in the 400 meter freestyle. I don't know about you guys, but when I was 15, I, I was not that good at anything. I was more concerned about popping pimples and girls than I was, you know, breaking world records. So I think that's pretty impressive to be that young and be that good. Um, you know, he's obviously known for the freestyle. He has uh, also won uh, a medal, though, in the 100 medley relay. So he's got that going. He's the most, he was the most successful athlete at the 2000 Olympics, which happened to be in Australia. And it's always great when you can have the Olympics in your own backyard. It makes you an even bigger star. 
uh, when you can go there and, and win medals. Um, and that's just a great thing. Now, the thing about him is he kind of retired abruptly at age 24, which is really young. He, he tried to come back a few years later that, that was not successful. He didn't qualify. Um, but a very young age to, to finish. But, you know, you look at his overall. He finished with nine Olympic medals. Uh, he was the World Swimmer of the Year, 99-01-02. So just an all-around great swimmer. So let me come to you, Josh. Ian Thorpe, freestyle was his dominant uh, event. Is, is he maybe the greatest of all time just in that particular event? Yeah, it's a, a really great argument to say that he's the best middle distance freestyler in the history of the world, the 200 and the 400 in particular. Um, when I saw him in 97 at Japan, at what we call the Pan Pacific Championships at 14 years old, he shocked the crowd and got silver in the 400. We're like, who is this 14 year old kid who just got second, one of the top times in the world? And then the next year at 15, in front of the Perth, Australia home crowd, he upsets Grant Hackett to win gold in that 400 and becomes an overnight superstar, international superstar at only 15. And then, of course, two years later in 2000, he wins five medals in front of the home crowd in Sydney. And I was right next to him on one of those medals. I had to <laughs> swim next to the torpedo and his size 17 feet. And guys, that's cheating. That's like wearing flippers. You shouldn't have to race a guy with flippers. And even though I was in his wake, I was just in awe. I didn't mind losing to this guy because he was so polite. He was so nice. He was such a great ambassador for his country and so articulate and kind. But man, that guy had a motorboat of a kick. And we, we had never, the world had never seen anything like that. And without those super suits in 2009, there's a German guy who broke Ian Thorpe's world records with his super suit, his special rubber suit. Everybody knows that that super suit totally helped the German guy, Paul Biederman, get those Ian Thorpe records. But everybody in the swimming world knows Ian Thorpe is technically still the world record holder of the 200 and the 400. And uh, we've never seen anything like it. And that run, 99, 2000, 2001, that, those three years, he was so dominant. He broke 13 world records in three years. No one had ever seen anything like it and he was so trained so hard and broke so many records I think it kind of it might have burned him out after that because he was never quite the same after that but still three Olympics and five medals or excuse me nine Olympic medals three Olympics unbelievable unbelievable the torpedo size 17 shoe that's like Shaq there that that's insane <laughs> he's, he's let's, monsters. Let, let's talk about the freestyle for a second it's also known as the front crawl um is it truly the fastest and most efficient stroke? Yeah, other than the dolphin kick underwater, which some guys have the ability to go very, very fast, actually faster than freestyle. But of course, you're not breathing and it takes tremendous skill. Only a few guys have mastered it to go that to go faster than freestyle. But in general, for the normal swimmer and even the elite swimmer, freestyle front crawl is the fastest way to get through the water. So we're going to move on to Kevin and and... He has probably the biggest gun tonight here. He, he likes to, to get the guaranteed players, as I like to call it. Michael Phelps. Hey, I had Phelps previously, and how could I not when I have him on my Wheaties box? <laughs> so listen, Phelps started out swimming at a young age, basically got into swimming because his mom wanted him to, and him and his sister just fell in love with the sport. And at age 10, he started holding national records for his age group already. 2000, he became the youngest male swimmer since 1932 to make an Olympic team. He has won 28 Olympic medals. He holds the all-time record for Olympic gold medals at 23. He holds the record for Olympic gold medals in individual events and total Olympic medals in individual events. Phelps beat out Spitz's record that was you know, set in 1972 that was mentioned earlier at the 2008 Olympics, winning eight gold medals. And to win eight gold medals – back-to-back, -back, like swimming every day, like that is intense. In 2004, he had already tied the record for eight medals at a single games by winning six gold and two bronze. Um, in 2012, Phelps had won four more gold medals, two silver medals. Uh, he actually retired after the 2012 Olympics, and then he made a comeback in 2014, 
and then competed in the Olympics in 2016, uh, where he was uh, actually designated as the flag bearer for the United States, walking out at the opening ceremony. He won another five gold medals, another silver medal at those Olympics. This made him the most successful Olympian for four Olympics in a row. Four straight Olympic Games, he was the most successful swimmer. He has won 82 medals in major international long course competitions. He has earned the World Swimmer of the Year Award eight times, the American Swimmer of the Year 11 times, as well as the FINA Swimmer of the Year Award in 2012 and 16. He was uh, Sports Illustrated Magazine's Sportsman of the Year Award uh, from the 2008 success that he had. Um, in 2008, there were some concerns that he may have been using some PEDs. So he actually signed up for what's called Project Believe, which is part of the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, where you can actually volunteer to take more tests on top of what the World Anti-Doping Agency wants you to do. And he passed every single test to prove that he's not doping, he's not cheating. Um, to answer the question of what Paul said about what Spitz thought of his career, well, this is what Spitz said at one, one of his interviews. I'd be remiss if I actually didn't tell you how great Michael is. So right now, before he goes to the Olympic Games in Rio, he has double everything I have. The first Olympic Games he was in, he didn't even win a medal. So he did all of that doubling what I did in just one extra Olympic Games. And that's quite incredible, to be honest with you. When he retired again in 2016, he had won more medals than 161 countries. The world and Olympic records, as well as the Guinness World Records he holds or held, he is the greatest swimmer of all time and one of the greatest athletes of all time. He's listed number one on numerous lists of greatest swimmers of all time. Hands down, this is the best swimmer we're talking about tonight. This guy retired more times than Brett Favre. That's, that's how many times he retired. And he came back and kept performing well. So did Favre for a little while there. <laughs> Anyways, I digress. So, Josh, you were his captain in 2000. I mean, did you... Did you see then he was going to become as good as he was? And also, we don't rank them when we pick our top five. We just pick five for the list. Is is it Phelps and everyone else? Yeah, it's got to be. I mean, what he's accomplished, how he's put swimming on the map. He's the Michael Jordan of swimming. Kevin, great, great bio, by the way, great research. 39 world records, five Olympic Games, um, overcoming a lot of adversity. Um, some of his stories in each of these meets are legendary. You know, I tell his stories to all the camps I get to run across the country. They're just legendary. We may not have time to go into many of them. But, um, and, you know, and he finally got it. He finally got it on his fifth Olympics. He realized how he could finally give back and meet the team. And he got elected captain and flag bearer, you know, to sort of see his growth as a human being over those five Olympics is really rewarding. Because when I was on the team with him in 2000, he's just a 15-year-old kid soaking it up you know, just kind of watching, looking around. And I was the oldest guy on the team. He's the youngest. And so I do the 200 free. He does the 200 fly. So we were training mates that whole month. And I could, you know, I could kind of beat him back then. But I thought, man, this little skinny kid, if he sticks around, he might be pretty good. And so sure enough, he stuck around and became the greatest of all time. So no, honest, honestly, we did not see it uh, back then. We just knew he was a tough sucker and he loved to train. And the funny story, though, that I will tell one of his many legendary stories he was so pissed at the 2000 Olympics in Sydney that he got fifth place. He didn't medal his first Olympics, like, like Kevin said. And so the next day, when you can take a few days off or even a few weeks off, but no, the next day in the Sydney Olympic pool, he did a two-hour practice to get ready for the Athens four years later. And rumor has it, he didn't miss a practice, miss a day for the next four years. And sure enough, he goes from zero medals to eight medals in Athens 2004 and he didn't skip a day not even Sundays for four years and it started in the Olympic pool in Sydney and he did what nobody was willing to do in practice and that's why he's got more medals than anybody ever has in history. That's what it takes to be the best absolutely and he's training now well uh training one of the people we're going to be talking about later that Kevin's also representing so we'll get into that in a little bit Let's uh, move on to uh, Grant Hackett. Okay, Grant's the man. He's got more gold than Mr. T, but he's an Australian swimmer, and he's really regarded as a phenomenal distance swimmer. Born um, uh, May 1980, May 9th, 1980, but he's probably most famous for the 1,500-meter freestyle. He won gold uh, for this category in the 2000 
Olympics in Sydney and the 2004 Summer Olympics in Athens. He dominated the 1500 meter event for about a decade, uh, being undefeated in this event in the finals from 96 until I guess about the 2007 World Aquatics Championships. In total, he won 10 long course world championship gold medals. He set a total of 15 world records, five long course and 10 short course, and still holds the world record in the 1500 meter short course event that he set in 2001. Captain of the Australian swim team from 05 to 08. He broke his first world record in 1999 in the 200 meter freestyle in 92. He remained unbeaten in the 1500 meter freestyle from 97 to 2007. He's the first swimmer to win four straight world titles in one event, which was the 1500 free meter freestyle. And most legendary performance came in the 2004 Olympic Games where Grant overcame respiratory complications to win the 1500 meter freestyle. He's got a ton of medals and awards. Like I said earlier, 2000 Olympic Games gold in the 1500 meter freestyle, again in 2004, 2008, he drops down to a silver in the same category. 1998 World Championships, gold, 1500 meter freestyle. 2001, three and five World Championships. He gets the gold in the 1500 and 800 meter freestyle. Um, I could go on and on. This guy is a long distance king, but Grant Hackett, man, he's got to have lungs the size of basketballs. So, so with Grant, it might be because of the time period that he has swam in, but he's not the the household name that some of these other swimmers are. It, is there maybe a reason behind that? Is he just not uh, out there as much? Is he more quiet? And tell us about uh, him in the pool. What are your thoughts on him? Yeah, there was a guy right before Grant Hackett, a very famous Australian distance swimmer named Kieran Perkins. And he won the gold in 92 and 96. And then along came Grant Hackett and Ian Thorpe. And that era was the golden era of men's swimming in Australia. And because they dominated the world scene. Ian in the 200 and the 400 and Grant in the 400, 800 and mile. And the two of them on the distance relay together, forget about it. Those two guys, and then uh, a guy named Michael Clem, and then anybody else. <laughs> they were winning gold all the time in the distance relay for Australia. And that was their golden era. And so obviously Grant Hackett had to share some of the limelight with Ian Thorpe since they're contemporaries. But, but Grant swam the, the distance events a little bit longer, 800 and the mile, 800 to 1500. And then one time, at the World Champs, Grant and Ian raced in the 800 together, and it was epic. They were stroke for stroke the whole seven and a half minutes. I can't tell you what happened. You got to watch it on YouTube. It's incredible. I think that was 2003. They finally raced each other. But um, I'll, have, I'll have to look for that clip because we had we had video clips to these shows. So, oh, cool. That'll be a good one to check out. But 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 Grant really got it as a as a team leader, as a captain, as an ambassador. He was a good guy. And uh, really enjoyed my time getting to know him and uh, what he tried to do for the Australian team and the legacy he tried to leave. So I, I have a lot of respect for a guy who did the hardest event and led the world in the hardest event for 10 years. So it's pretty impressive. So before we move on to our, our next uh, competitor, let's talk about the breaststroke for a second here. They say it's kind of considered the most popular stroke. Uh, you know, is, th is that true? You would know better than all of us, of course. And my question on that too is why do the, when professionals swim it, they, 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 they dip their head in the, in the glide phase. Why, why is that? Because that, that's not how you're, we're taught. I, I don't know. Yeah, there's a rule at the beginning of every breaststroke lap, you get what we call one big pull down where the arms actually go all the way down to the side and then you get one frog kick and then you have to come up and start doing the, the breaststroke. So it's kind of a cool rule. I don't know who invented it, but I'm so glad they did because this pull down is really a nice little weapon to kind of surge ahead. And so I'm not a breaststroker, but I'm a good pull downer. So that first pull down really helps guys like me. So I don't know who invented it, but it's a great little rule. At the beginning of every lap, you can hold your breath and get one huge pull down and then come up and do the regular frog stroke, breaststroke. So kind of a cool little thing about breaststroke. Excellent. 
All right, let's move on to Alexander Popov. All right, Alexander Popov. Um, he was born in the Soviet Union, um, 1992 in Barcelona. He represented what was then called the unified team. Uh, Soviet Union was no more at that point. And the 50-meter freestyle and 100-meter freestyle, he won the gold in both of those. And the 100-meter freestyle relay and the 100-meter medley relay, uh, his team got silver um, in both of those. So then 1996 in Atlanta, it was basically a repeat of the same thing. The same two individual events, he got the gold. The same two relay events, they got the silver. Um, and he became the, the, the only man to defend both of those individual titles before. No one had ever done the 50 meter freestyle and the 100 meter freestyle in back-to-back -back Olympics like that at gold. So then there was, um, then, then he went to Sydney in 2000 and he took the silver in the 100 meter freestyle. And this was very significant because uh, Popov, he had actually survived an attack in, in the Russian uh, streets um, four years earlier. He was actually stabbed in the abdomen. Uh, with a knife, and the wound damaged the membrane that's around the lungs. And, and so, you know, I'm sure that probably had some effect on his breathing. I mean, the lungs are so important to, to swimmers. So for him to bounce back and be able to take a silver, um, you know, the, in the next Olympics was, was, uh, was very, uh, uh, very amazing. Plus, during the 2000 Olympic uh, trials, he set the world record for the 50-meter freestyle. And that stood for the next eight years. So he set a world record and got a silver after being stabbed four years earlier. Um, he's an incredible swimmer, just like uh, he was more geared towards the, the sprint type, the shorter type ones, just incredibly fast in those. And, um, you know, he just certainly belongs in this conversation. It's said of him that he has the best technique in history. So I'm sure Josh can fill us in on that. And then also, how hard is it to come back from a career-threatening injury like that and still be one of the best in the world? Yeah, to, to win the 50 and 100 free, the premier events in two Olympics in a row was incredible. And then to come back after the stab wound, I can't imagine. I mean, because you're messing with some, some pretty important stuff. But he was able to come back and he competed for many more years after that, you know, with, with varying success, but he was still top three in the world consistently so you're talking from 91 when he came on the scene to 2004 I mean that's 13 years leading the world in the premier sprint events there's, there's no one that has ever done that in track 13 years you know and he did it clean and it helps to be 6'8 very tall and so when you see his perfect technique on his 6'8 frame it just is just it's just beautiful to watch he, he totally sets himself apart from everybody else with his perfect technique and his huge long arms. I mean, it is beautiful to watch. And I modeled my swimming so many times. I'd watch his videos before I went to practice to try and swim like Alexander Popov. And, um, you know, for years, everybody studied him. And uh, he was the premier sprinter, the top fastest man in the world for almost 10 years, over 10 years. And it, that's, that's pretty cool to say that he was, he was the king of sprints for, for a very long time. Brian, you mentioned he was part of the unified team. So, you know, the, 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 the Russia was, you know, suspended for certain reasons and they formed the unified team. Josh, was there any concerns from you or and maybe any other Olympians that you knew of that because of what had happened that maybe they might be getting something or getting away with something again when they come back as a unified team? What I do know is that he got tested a lot and he trained a lot in Australia where they have reliable testing and reliable accountability like we do in America. It's tough to say in those towns in Russia and China if they're actually getting significantly tested. But, um, but I think in his case, I got to believe it, it, he was clean. I really believe it. I mean, he was so genetically talented. He didn't, he didn't need it. But I, I do know Russia has definitely struggled with that. It is, it is embedded in their sporting culture. 
that's there's no doubt about it. But I think in his case, he didn't need it. And he was able to kind of do most of his training in Australia where there was legitimate testing and results. So, so yeah, I think his legacy is clean. And the Russian rocket absolutely has to be in the top five. All right, let's move on to Johnny Weissmuller. This is uh, this is going back quite a ways, <laughs> probably before any of our viewers were even alive. But he may not be the best swimmer of all time like Michael Phelps, but I'll tell you this, he might have transcended the sport more than anyone, and I'll, I'll get into that in a minute here. But uh, So American swimmer with five gold medals at the Olympics, and that goes back to 1924 and 1928 Olympics. That's still not the oldest Olympian we've ever talked about. Brian, you still own that one with Jim Thorpe <laughs> when we had uh, Tessa Gobo on. So, But uh, he was coached by the uh, famous coach Bill Bachrock. Hope I got that one right. <laughs> he was also a father figure to him. I, I, I read about their relationship, and uh, they, they were really close, really close. So... Now, Johnny set two world records in 1921, and then in 1922, he breaks the 100-meter freestyle record. In 1927, he broke the 100-yard freestyle world record. So he kept up his performance for many, many years, um, and he was so good in the water that he was actually a member of the U.S. Olympic polo team, and he got a bronze medal with the, the polo team there. Played in two Olympics uh, for polo. The, got the bronze in 24, and then in 28, they finished, I think, seventh. So there was no medal that time. But, you know, we talk, we talk legacies on this show. So let, let's, let's talk a little bit beyond the pool legacy here. Um, he played Tarzan in 12 movies and has starred in over 35 feature films. This is the, like the, one of the original... Tarzan guys here. He has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And Dad, if you're listening, you're going to love this. He is on one of your album covers, the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So go check your album. You'll, you'll find him on there. Josh, I, I know this is before your, <laughs> your time too, but what are your thoughts on Johnny? No, oh, I knew Johnny Weissmuller's legacy very, very well. Growing up in the 80s, I would see those shows on TV, you know, just skimming cable. And, uh, you know, he actually actually was his voice recording the Tarzan yell, but they played it backwards. That's how they made it so unique. They played it backwards, but that's his voice. But, um, yeah, five gold in the Olympics, 67 total world records, 12 Tarzan movies, like you said. He saved 11 people from drowning over the course of his life. Five wives. I mean, he may have more superlatives than any of the people on our list. But, but you're right. He was, for those decades, the most famous swimmer on the planet. And honestly, one of the most famous actors and famous humans on the planet during those two decades. So pretty, pretty amazing that we have a swimmer that had that much global recognition. Pretty cool. So, so going back into the pool here for a second, was the competition that he had maybe not as good as the competition the swimmers are facing today? Yes, yes. I mean, he was a big guy, 6'4", 200 pounds. I mean, he, he could dominate the, uh, everybody back then. The depth isn't like it is now. The rest of the world, you know, hasn't caught up to USA like they have now. You know, so, yeah, he was just a, a men among boys back then. But, you know, still, he had to work for it. And he had, you know, he had to train a lot. And that longevity of racing and world records and staying in shape for those Tarzan movies, you know, is pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. All right, let's move on to our final, final swimmer tonight. And that's going to be Ryan Locke. I kind of feel like he probably would have been an even uh... – more successful swimmer if he, if he wasn't swimming around the same time as Phelps. Um, a lot of times they were kind of one and two, um, and they performed well together when they raced together. Oh, my goodness. Dominated competition. But, uh, you know, Ryan didn't really take swimming seriously until about age 14 uh, when he was in junior high. He had lost at the Junior Olympics, and he just said that he was sick of losing. And I uh, didn't want to lose there again. Um, and so he started to take it a little more seriously. He went on to the University of Florida, 
uh, where he was actually the NCAA Swimmer of the Year twice, seven-time uh, NCAA champion, seven-time SEC champion, 24-time All-American. During his senior year, uh, he had won national titles in all three of his uh, individual events, uh, setting a U.S. Open and American records in the 200-yard individual medley and the 200-yard backstroke. Uh, he also broke Tom Dolan's uh, nearly decade-old uh, NCAA record uh, in the 400-yard individual medley. He's a 12-time Olympic uh, medalist, six for gold. Um, <clears throat> he has the second most total number of Olympic medals behind only Michael Phelps. Uh, seven individual Olympic medals, ranked second in history in the men's swimming behind Phelps, tied for second among Olymp Olympic swimmers. Uh, he currently holds world records in the 200-meter individual medley, long course and short course. Um, as part of the American teams, he also holds the world record in the 4x200-meter freestyle long course and 4x100-meter style uh, relay. Uh, he has won the SWAMI Award uh, for U.S. Male Swimmer of the Year in 2013, the World Swimmer of the Year Award, and the American Swimmer of the Year Award twice. Um, he has also been named the FINA Swimmer of the Year three times. He's won a total of 90 medals in major international competitions. 54 of those were gold, 22 were silver. That's pretty impressive. He has great speed. He gets a lot of distance under the water. He has a strong kick when he's under the water. Um, he dominated the short course format for sure. Uh, PledgeSports.com and TopEndSports.com have him listed in the top 10 greatest swimmers of all time. Um, he's had some out-of-pool issues. I'm sure you all know and are aware of that. Uh, but it doesn't take away from his talent and what he has done for the Olympic swimming. He's definitely a top five swimmer. Um, and if you go by wins and medals alone, he's, he's top two. So I think he definitely has a strong argument to be top five for tonight. Pretty good at the backstroke, too, uh, from what I read. And we'll talk about the backstroke here in a minute. But, Josh, so with Ryan, it, it's almost like Kevin sort of said at the beginning that he's always been in Michael Phelps' shadow. He's being trained by Phelps now. So what are your expectations for him going into these uh, Olympics if, if they still occur this summer? What do, you, what do you think he's going to do? And, and tell us about Ryan in the pool. Yeah, if there was no Phelps, Ryan Lochte would be, easily be the greatest swimmer of all time. Uh, what he's accomplished internationally is huge. Like Kevin was saying, unbelievable resume. But and not just for IM. He can do freestyle. He can do backstroke. He's, he's an accomplished uh, breaststroke and butterflyers. That's, that's why his IM is so good. But, um, you know, at 36 years old, he's, done, he's gone to four Olympics. He's done great at all of them. And then just a month ago, he tried out for his fifth Olympics, just missed it. Missed it, yeah. And, and him and Michael are great buds, and they talk regularly because they're kind of, they kind of came out of some stuff at the same time. They both met, you know, their, their wife, and that really straightened them out. And they both have beautiful children now and a beautiful family, and they both really, really have um, blossomed these last few years as, as men, as ambassadors. And it's just really cool to see. But he just missed the team at 36 years old. He's still training now. He's back in the pool now for some international races coming up this fall. And the guy just loves swimming. And no one, no one sticks around to sign autographs more for more kids than Ryan Lochte. Not many people know that. He kind of gets a bad rap for getting in a little trouble now and again, drinking a little too much back in the day. But no one loves kids and loves swimming more than Ryan Lochte. I've seen it with my own eyes. And uh, I just love his heart. Uh, his resume is incredible. He's still racing now. Um, he probably might race till he's 40, a few more years, three more years till the next Olympics. Who knows what happens for Paris 24. And, um, yeah, incredible swimmer. Before we go on to our boat, let's talk the backstroke for a second. It's the last stroke to talk about tonight here. Obviously, it's the only one on your back. <laughs> but uh, so let me ask you, it seems like all these swimmers were dominant in a lot of events, but the backstroke is usually the one that's kind of left out and it's won by other people. Is, is what, what do you think the reasoning is for that? Well, a lot of people haven't mastered the backstroke, even though it's the easiest of the strokes because they can't see what their hand is doing when they enter behind their head. So it kind of takes a certain feel and trust to grab that water because you can't see it because you're supposed to keep your head really still and not look around. And so every now and again, um, some people get really good at it. And USA actually has this incredible backstroke history because we had John Neighbor that won the gold in 76. And then we had Rick Carey in 84. And then we had uh, David Burkhoff in 88, Jeff Rouse in 92, 
um, Jeff Rouse in 96, Lenny Kraselberg in 2000, Aaron Pearsall 2004 and 2008, and Ryan Lochte 2008, and now a guy named Ryan Murphy. So we, we've had this incredible string of backstroke gold medalists from the USA since 1976, John Neighbor. So uh, USA has got great backstrokers, and now for the first time, our legacy is in jeopardy. Russia's got this great backstroke guy that's going to challenge our king of backstroke, Ryan Murphy. So anyway, just backstroke is sometimes tricky because you can't see what your arms are doing, um, but USA has a strong history in it. All right, let's move into our vote tonight. Paul, who are you taking? Well, even though Kevin and I are enemies pretty much from birth, you can't argue against Michael Phelps. So I know that he's going to get a lot of votes. I'm going to Michael Phelps. But, you know, Michael, I'm going to give your your original founding father, Johnny, some love because I think he, uh, with his fame, I think he really did a lot for swimming. And, you know, we've almost wished swimmers had some personality like that. But uh, I'll go with Johnny. Oh, okay. All right. Brian? Well, I'm going to go with, uh, with Mark Spitz. Um, you know, like, uh, like what Josh said, you know, the original goat, um, there, there's still, he still gets into the news you know, from time to time. You know, he's a, a guy that everybody wants to know his opinion on what's going on in swimming. So, um, you know, he's, he's got a great legacy from the time that he competed all the way up until now. Wow. So <laughs> you guys don't take Phelps, which puts pressure on me because Kevin can't pick Phelps because he represented him. <laughs> so, I mean, Phelps is the greatest swimmer of all time, so he's got to be on this list. But there were some other guys I wanted to pick, but I can't not have Michael Phelps on this list, so I got to go with Phelps. Kevin, you're up. <clears throat> I'm going to have to go with uh, Ian Thorpe. I think uh, what he did for Australian swimming and uh, holding that, setting that record for youngest swimmer to get a world record, I think that's pretty impressive. So that leaves it up to you, Josh, of the remaining four. Well, <laughs> I, 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 I'd have to go with Phelps. What his four hundred IM world record well, is still. He, he's already on. I picked Phelps. You got to pick one who didn't. Oh, I got to pick someone else. Phelps. Yeah. <laughs> you got you got Lockney, Hackett, uh, Popoff, Popoff, or or neighbor. No, neighbor was picked. Already picked Weismuller. Yeah, Paul picked Weismuller. Okay, okay. All right, then I got to go with Lochte. I got to go with Lochte. So, um, yeah, at one point, no one could touch him in the back, and the IM, and the freestyle. And he's his his highlight reel is is I put it up there with anybody's. Well, here's our top five tonight, then, and it makes sense that the United States would dominate it because it is a United States-dominated sport. Johnny Weissmiller, Mark Spitz, Michael Phelps, uh, Ryan Lochte, and our only non-American, Ian Thorpe. All you right. guys are all in trouble. I'm going to tell, tell John Neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, John. We love you. We Thank you for doing the show, John. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Didn't, didn't make the list tonight. <laughs> I, voted, I voted for you, John. I was in your, I was in your corner, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to our Q and A. And it looks like, uh, well, I won the show tonight because I got two out of. I got two my, also. Uh, oh, did you? Oh, okay. Then, Kevin, you get first question. <laughs> um. So yeah, uh, how'd you get? How just how'd you get into swimming and um, kind of. Go through what your schedule's like when you were training. Yeah, so I talked about summer league earlier. We moved into a neighborhood when I was 12 that had a cool little neighborhood pool, and that was what all the kids did for June and July was the summer league, and I just fell in love with it. I was terrible, but I just loved, you know, being in the water and being with my swimming friends. And then finally when I was 13, I thought, you know, I kind of need to pick a sport in high school, and I'm not that good at basketball or baseball or gymnastics or tennis or, you know, all those other track. I did pole vault in, high, in middle school, and I loved it, but I was just terrible. Um, so I thought, well, maybe I could be with my, my swimmer friends on the high school team. So I joined the big high school club team, or excuse me, eighth grade. I try out with the club team to get ready for high school. And the coach sees how bad I am, tells me I should switch sports because I'll oh. never make it as a swimmer. Instead of switching sports, I switched coaches and everything was fine after that. I got a great coach, great club. And I was on my way. I was high school champion right away. And 
then collegiate champion and then finally made the Olympics. And so, but anyway, at 14, when I started with the high school team here in Texas, in San Antonio, Texas, where I, where I live, we had a great uh, system where we train with our high school coach in the morning for an hour and a half and then train with our club coach after school down the street for an hour and a half. So I was training twice a day, hour and a half in the morning, hour and a half at night, all four years of high school, all four years of college, and four more years as the pro with the USA team. So 12 years, I was going hour and a half, 90 minutes in the morning, 90 minutes at night, all out. And that's just what it took to be great. Hey, real quick, did you bump into that coach again later on um, in your yeah. career? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're friends now. It was just a really bad call. You know, I, was, I was so late because all my friends had been swimming since five and six, and I was now 13. He just couldn't see the potential, and uh, it all worked out in the end. You can hear more about that story on YouTube if you look up Josh Davis' aha moment. I checked that out. It was, yeah. it was pretty good stuff. So uh, let me go next here. Tell us about your book, The Goal and the Glory. Yeah, so uh, a publisher, you know, contacted me to write a book of Olympic stories and uh, kind of their inspirational God moments of, of how, you know, what significant moments in their sporting career, um, you know, from a spiritual standpoint. And I just loved it. I interviewed 30 Olympians and their stories. And we came up with about two stories per Olympian for a total of 60 stories, 60 chapters. And the best part, the chapters are only two pages long. How awesome is that? But these stories, that's right. So two chapters, two pages long. But the stories are super fun and super insightful of what was going on in these unique, you know, critical moments in their Olympic, in, in, in their lives, in their Olympics. So I really enjoyed that, that putting that book together. That was for, that covered all the Olympics going into 2004 because it came out for the 2008 Olympics. So now I need to do version two because there's 08, we've got stories from 08, 012, and 016, and now 2020. So I'm four Olympics now where I need to write version two and get all the cool stories from those four Olympics. So hopefully I can do version two. But the goal and the glory, I think, can still be found out there on Amazon. Perfect. Brian? Of your, uh, of your five Olympic medals, um, is there one that stands out above the rest as like the one that you're most proud of? The first one is always the most special. And for me, that was the four by 200 free relay, the distance relay. And at that Atlanta Olympics in front of the home crowd, we were not predicted to win. We were maybe, maybe going to get a bronze. The odds in Vegas had us maybe at a bronze. Well, we win the gold by a body length. The crowd goes nuts. I'm on the podium with my three teammates getting that gold medal, looking at this Atlanta home crowd thinking, holy cow, I did it, I did it, and uh, we did it, you know, and so I thought of all my teachers and coaches and parents and family and friends and teammates that helped me get there, and it was singing that anthem, looking at that flag, being in front of the home crowd at the Atlanta Olympics, it was just a dream come true, and I got a lot of free food after that, showing the medal to all my friends and going to restaurants, and it was great, it was great. Well, Mike mentioned this at the top of the show, but I read – if, if this is correct, I read where you were tasked with building both the men's and the women's swim team, uh, coaching both. That, to me, seems incredibly challenging. I'm thinking about other sports, and I'm thinking about differences. But maybe you can answer this. Am I wrong? It, do you have to modify your approach? What's the challenges with that? Yes, coaching, coaching men and women is a little bit different. And, um, you know, we're still young. We're, I'm starting my fifth year now is a college coach for the men's and women's team. And so we built our team up pretty fast and we've got some fast, fast kids going now. Um, but yeah, there's a little different take and I'm still learning a lot about how to um, keep the girls team bonded and connected, which is really important for them and to keep the guys team, you know, having fun and being in the weight room and doing, you know, cool guys things in practice. So there, there, is, there is a difference. And so I'm still working that out. I'm learning from a lot of the great college and Olympic coaches that have gone before me that I'm friends with, that, uh, that have been mentors to me. So, so no, it, it's, it is important to, to do guys and girls a little bit different and each athlete a little bit differently. That's where you, a coach really earns their money is when we can really customize the program for each of these athletes while staying together as a group. And so so, yeah, I feel blessed to be at this great little college, Oklahoma Christian University. We're now the only swim team, only college swim team in the whole state of Oklahoma. 
And so it's a great opportunity for the Oklahoma Stormers to come here. It's a great opportunity for the, all the five states around us, Texas, Arkansas, Missouri, Kansas. We've been a great place for them to come train after high school. Awesome. Kevin. <clears throat> so you went to the University of Texas. Um, was there like a, a, another school that just dominated in, in swimming or still continues to dominate in swimming? And is college swimming really any different than the Olympics? I mean, you're pretty much, I mean, yeah, yeah there's more talent in other countries. I mean, but you're swimming against the same people pretty much that are on the Olympic team for the most part. I mean, is it, is there a big difference between the transition of college to Olympics? Yeah, everybody, all the 50 swimmers, the 25 guys and 25 girls that we're going to watch next week in Tokyo, they're all great rivals from their college teams. But now they're on the USA, USA team together as a big family. But during the college years, they're bitter rivals. And so right now for men, Texas is still dominating almost 40 years now. Eddie Reese, the Olympic coach, has been the most dominant, most successful college coach of all time. 15 national titles since 1981, spread out over the last 40 years. Unbelievable legacy. Um, but the usual suspects, um, Stanford, um, USC, but now the new ones, the new kids on the block is NC State. North Carolina State is really good. Virginia for women are really good. Virginia is going to be, used to be Stanford for women. Now it's Virginia. I think they're going to win. They got a bunch of Olympic girls on the Virginia team now, which is kind of interesting. So um, top five also is Indiana, Louisville, um, Florida. So, you know, traditionally it was the coast, you know, like the California team, Stanford, USC, and Florida, but, but Texas is always in the mix. So, yeah, so those are kind of the names I dropped are some of the big college names. Brian. Um, you know, uh, you competed in the Olympics in Atlanta in 1996. And then also, of course, in Sydney in 2000, um, do you feel like there was more pressure on you when it was when the Olympics were stateside or was there more pressure on you when the Olympics were so far away from home? You know, that's an interesting question, because in Atlanta, it was the home crowd, but we were just so comfortable there. Um, the village, we had our training camp at the University of Tennessee for a few weeks, and then we drove over to Atlanta uh, to move into the village. And I've uh, just had a wonderful time there. So I didn't feel a lot of pressure, even though it was the home crowd, thankfully. But Australia was interesting because swimming is one of the top sports in Australia. It's like rugby, cricket, and swimming. They go cuckoo over those three. And, you know, just like our baseball, you know, basketball and football, that's rugby, cricket, and swimming in, in, you know, for Australia. That, they, that's, they all know about it. They all talk about it. And so I was more famous in Australia than I am here because I was racing Ian Thorpe, their top swimmer. So there was more pressure and I was captain of the team. And I, I really, you know, there was a lot of talk, a lot of that uh, the Australia was finally going to upend us and become the number one swimming nation. And they wanted to do it in front of the home crowd. And so we, we were really not very strong in 98 and 99 leading into the 2000 Olympics. And so I think Australia could kind of smell blood in the water. And thankfully we got there and we just, we just rocked it. You know, Ian Thorpe was really good the first day. It kind of scared us, winning two gold medals and two world records that first night. But then the USA team kind of took over after that. And it was one of our most dominant performances ever in Australia. So the pressure, the extra pressure in Australia land, Aussie land, really took us to the next level. Oh. So is really interesting to me because we, we talk with other athletes about their sports and they always talk about how it evolves over time, but like you can't make the distances longer. It, it has, has swimming evolved? We joked earlier with Johnny Weissmuller, but it's, you know, in, in, the, in terms of the competition, is that what it is? Has the competition evolved? What, what is, what are your, what's your take on that? There's a, there's a lot of things involved. I mean, we are getting some better genetics. You know, you, you get some better, bigger, bigger feet, just bigger people and just crazy good genetics. Um, but we have better coaching. We're getting smarter of how to do um, training cycles. You know, track and field has been leading the way for decades on this. And swimming, we kind of have our own culture and our own training cycles, but we're kind of learning from other sports. You know, weights, how we do weights, how we eat, how we do our training cycles are getting a little bit better and a little bit smarter. And, um, yeah, just, just all three of those things combined. There's faster pools. 
better training and better human structures, you know, better genetics. Um, and then every now and again, you see these world breakers like the people we talked about tonight. So there so we'll is get, some. Yes. So we'll get you out of here with this tonight. Um, it's a two-parter because nobody asked the two questions I had left. So I'm turning it into a two-part question. Um, I heard, I read that your medals were stolen from your car. So I yeah. definitely want that story. But then uh, I saw that you had a list of your most inspirational movies. And it was uh, Rocky at three, Rudy at two, and Chariots of Fire at one. So I was just wondering if anything's changed on that list. Yeah, so it is true. Great questions, by the way. It is true that my three gold medals were stolen from my car uh, years ago. And somehow, miraculously, they were all returned. And I'm so grateful whoever stole them brought them back because the whole town, it was on the front page of the newspaper. It was on all the news stations, Olympians medals stolen. And the whole city of San Antonio was hoping and praying they'd come back. And sure enough, they all came back. So I I'm, I'm still get to pass the gold medals around the kids all over the country where I speak and teach. So it's, I'm grateful to, for that. Um, yeah, I'm a huge Rocky fan. Um, Me too. Love Rocky. Number three and four, my favorites. So uh, Rudy, I cry every time when he gets the letter and uh, I just lose it. And Chariots of Fire is very special to me. It was one of the first, you know, movies I, I remember watching, sports movies I remember watching when it came out. And it just, the music intrigued me. The, and as I, I studied, as I got into high school and college and I studied the lives of those two athletes, Eric Little and Harold Abrams, and I studied their lives and their motivations. It, it really was powerful to me. And plus, it's a true story. It actually really happened. And to see how these guys um, lived their lives as ambassadors, you know, as humans and for the sport was, was very inspiring to me. And I just, I just love the choreography or the cinematography of that movie. It's a very, very beautiful movie. So, yeah, those, those, I still watch them today at least a couple times a year. So they got the greatest score of all time in the Chariots of Fire. That's just amazing music. But yeah. thank you to Josh Davis for joining us tonight. Uh, always an honor to have Olympians on. I said that earlier, but I, I absolutely love that. So thank you so much. And uh, I want to thank everybody who was watching on YouTube or Facebook or were listening on iHeart, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Everyone have a great night, and we'll see you next time.